Hello and welcome back to class. This is Holistics Therapeutics, HT400, for the College of Natural Health Sciences, Bermuda. My name is Dr. Delcina Bean Burrows, and this is Lecture 4G, where we will be looking at clinical instruments that are used in foot health practice. And in terms of our Lecture 4G objectives, at the end of this lecture, students will be familiar with the basic instruments used in foot health practice, be familiar with the personal protective equipment or PPE used to carry out foot care procedures that generate debris and dust particles, understand the donning and doffing process of PPE, and be familiar with the techniques and protocols used to clean, disinfect, sterilize pediatric equipment to prevent cross-contamination and infections of patients, practitioners, and equipment. So let's begin our lecture today by looking at the basic instruments that we use in foot health practice, and these are referred to as pediatric equipment. And the basics include the nail nippers, sometimes also referred to as nail clippers, dermal curette, the rotary tool, also referred to as a drill, rasp or nail files, and then the ancillary equipment that we use would be the hemostat as well as the scissors. But we're primarily looking at the uh, first four items here, which is what we use to perform our very basics of care, which would be the uh, nail debridement as well as callus and corn debridement. And we're going to discuss each one of these in greater detail. The toenail nippers. There are two types that we tend to use in foot health practice. The first is the single action nail nipper, and it's referred to as a single action nail nipper because it has one hinge and it is most commonly used by foot health practitioners, and it's usually very effective. Then we have the double action nail nipper that has two hinges and it is used for thicker nails, especially when sanding the nail is not possible. Nail nippers must be stainless steel, which means they can be properly disinfected. They can't be chrome. We also have the dermal curette. The dermal curette is used to remove dead skin and nail debris found in the nail sulcus. It's also used to smooth rough nail edges to prevent ingrown toenails and also to remove debris around the nail bed. And characteristically, they are fine tipped with a narrow head, usually 1.5 millimeters on one side and either two to three millimeters on the other side with an easy grip, and they are made from surgical grade stainless steel, which means that they are fully autoclavable, sterilization safe. The rotary tool. The rotary tool is used to sand thick nails, corns, and calluses. There are many types on the market, and the price ranges from under $100 to up to $3,000. Some come equipped with a water spray feature, and this type of podiatry drill debrids nails and calluses while cooling the burr and the patient tissue with a mist of distilled water and alcohol. Because when you are doing sanding and drilling, the burr tends to get rather hot. So you have to uh, take breaks in between. But this uh, high powered electronic technology is designed for continuous operation which allows practitioners to treat more patients within a day. So when first starting out, most practitioners, foot health practitioners, will use a portable drill, such as the utilized nail drill, due to its affordability and powerful capacity. And the utilized nail drill was what you received in your clinical instrument package way back when. And so the utilized nail drill has 10 different heads that can be switched according to the type of sanding procedure that you're doing. And the heads can be properly cleaned and disinfected. 
So we will definitely uh, go over the disinfecting and cleaning procedures when we have our practical class. But for now, you will, you will see illustrated here all the different heads that the utilized nail drill does have. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there are so many nail drills that are out there that are on the market, but whatever you start off using and you feel comfortable with it, you know, you are welcome to continue with that. There's no right or wrong in, in that sense. However, uh, when you are able to establish yourself in your practice and you are able to afford it, sometimes the uh, practitioner will go on and they will get one of the more fancy ones that has the water spray and all of that. But certainly if you stick with the uh, utilize or a similar type drill, you should be fine. Rasp and nail files. Foot rasps are routinely used to sand heels and calluses, while large emery boards can be used to sand toenails. Patients whose skin is thick enough and well nourished can use these tools safely at home in between visits. Use your own clinical judgment when deciding which of your clients can be properly instructed in home maintenance procedures. The following items should never be used in foot care. The razor blade, it can cut the skin causing bleeding and can also lead to infection and the blades cannot be properly disinfected. The pumice bar is ineffective because the skin may be too thick. However, they can cause micro tears in the skin that can lead to infection. And Dr. Scholl's corn or calluses remover, the acid that is used in these removers eats straight from the skin into the bone. So you definitely do not want to use this in your practice. If your clients are using this at all, you must ask them to stop immediately because they will suffer ill effects from using any of these tools. But the doctor shows in particular, it can eat right through the skin, right through to the bone. And now for a word about the scalpel. In many jurisdictions, it is within the scope of foot health practice for practitioners to use the scalpel. In Bermuda, however, it is not within our scope to use the scalpel, which is reserved for chiropodists and podiatrists. Foot health practitioners who register with the Bermuda Natural Health Practitioners Council must abide by this stipulation even if they are trained in the use of the scalpel and have practiced in other jurisdictions where scalpel use is and was permitted. Now let's discuss personal protective equipment or PPE in foot care. Failure in the prevention of basic infection has been linked with an increased number of outbreaks in both hospital and non-hospital settings. Multiple public health investigations have highlighted various incidents of unsafe practices that put podiatric patients and practitioners at risk for viral, fungal, and bacterial infections. Some of these recorded outbreaks include wound infections caused by Proteus mirabilis associated with the use of contaminated bone drills during podiatric surgery, infection of the soft tissue caused by methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus following injections, soft tissue injections caused by mycobacterium abscesses secondary to a jet injector used for administration of lidocaine, spread of hepatitis B virus to, due to failure to separate clean podiatric equipment from the contaminated ones. These incidences highlighted the lapses in the disinfection and sterilization of the common podiatric equipment used in daily practices. 
Personal Protective Equipment, or PPE, is equipment used to protect pediatric healthcare practitioners from exposure to infectious agents. Some common examples of PPE include gloves, face masks, gowns, goggles, and respirators. The selection of the personal care equipment in pediatric practices is dependent on the type of patient interaction as well as the risk of exposure to body fluids, infectious agents, or blood. For safety reasons, all appropriate PPE supplies must be present in different sizes at every pediatric clinic. Any off-site podiatry providers must ensure that they have PPE at their disposal at all times. All the PPEs must be removed and discarded adequately before exiting the care area. Some common examples of using PPE for safe pediatric practices include the use of gloves in situations where contact with any type of body fluid, non-intact skin, mucous membrane, or any contaminated material is likely. The use of a gown in order to prevent the clothing and skin from contamination, and the use of eye, nose, and mouth protection in procedures that may generate splashes of blood or any other body fluid. So in terms of PPE that you will need as a foot health practitioner, the personal protective equipment, you're going to have a cloth or a paper fluid resistant gown, a surgical mask with eye shield, goggles, safety glasses, or a face shield. You're going to have exam gloves. These can be either nitrile or latex, but of course you always wanna make sure that your client isn't allergic to latex. Some people are allergic to latex, uh, and you yourself might be. So you wanna make sure that you have the right type of exam gloves that fit the situation. And of course, you want to have hair and shoe covers. So these are all the things that uh, you want to have. You want to make sure that you're wearing these things when you are performing any kind of nail debridement, any really any foot service uh, that requires um, protection, whereby you're going to be either generating nail dust or nail debris uh, or skin uh, debris in any way, shape, or form. You want to make sure that you're completely covered. Now let's take a look at the recommendations to don PPE or to put on personal protective equipment. Don is the short term for do put on. And surgeons use this term when they put on PPE. We will look at some of the critical recommendations in order to properly don PPE. You want to always maintain proper hand hygiene before donning any podiatric PPE. Always don the gown properly and fasten it at the back accordingly. Secure the elastic bands or ties of the respirator or face mask at the back of the head and neck. Always fit the flexible band of the face mask to the bridge of the nose. Extend the mask to cover the entire face, including the chin. Always adjust the face shield or goggles according to the face. If using gloves in combination with other PPE, always don it at last. If wearing a gown, extend the gown to cover the wrist of the gown completely. So now let's look at the recommendations to doff PPE. Doff is short for do put off. Surgeons use this term when they put off PPE. The following set of recommendations are to be followed by healthcare practitioners for a safer pediatric practice. Remove all PPE before leaving the care area or exam room, except the respirators that must be removed after exiting the infected room. In order to remove contaminated gloves properly, 
pull the outside of one glove with the opposite gloved hand and peel off. Hold the removed glove in the gloved hand. Slide the ungloved finger under the remaining glove on the wrist and pull off carefully. This must be followed by proper disposal of the gloves. When removing a face shield or goggles, do not touch its front as it is often contaminated. Instead, remove the PPE by handling the ear pieces or headbands and discard immediately. While removing a gown, turn the outside surface to the inside, roll, it, roll to a form, a bundle, and discard the gown as soon as possible. While removing a respirator or a face mask, grasp it from the elastic band or the ties and separate it from the face carefully. You want to discard it immediately. Always remember to follow proper hand hygiene immediately after the removal of PPE. So let's discuss sterilization. Sterilization refers to a process of killing all harmful microorganisms and spores and occurs after instruments have been cleaned to remove debris. Practicing sterilization in podiatric setup is extremely important and failure to abide by the rules of this process may result in serious outcomes that may include exposing patients to a high risk of infection or contamination, legal action, potential outbreaks of dangerous pathogens, facility closures, negative publicity, damage to the practice or a complete loss of practice, and referral to the licensing board for immediate disciplinary action, or in the case where, uh, such as the case for foot health practice in Bermuda, you would be referred to the uh, self-regulatory body, which would be the Bermuda Natural Health Practitioners Council. So let's discuss the various types of sterilization. There are many types of sterilization used to disinfect and decontaminate podiatric instruments. The three most common procedures to sterilize surgical instruments are listed here. We have autoclaving, dry heat, and cold sterilization. And we will take a closer look at all three of these methods. So let's discuss autoclaving. Autoclaving, and this is an autoclave chamber to the left, refers to a type of sterilization with steam. For autoclaving, all the instruments must be properly cleaned and lubricated with an appropriate surgical instrument. An open position must always be adopted in order to autoclave the instruments because Locking the instruments will not allow the steam to reach all the surfaces, and exposure to heat can sometimes cause the metal to expand, which may lead to cracking of the hinges of the locked instruments. An autoclave chamber must never be overloaded. All instruments must be placed correctly in sterilization trays or wrapped in muslin or paper prior to autoclaving. This is to avoid contamination of these instruments following sterilization. The sterilization trays containing the instruments must be placed in an autoclave without stacking them. This will ensure that the steam circulates inside the autoclave freely. The time Pressure and temperature of the autoclave must be adjusted as per the instructions issued by the manufacturer. Within an autoclave, the instruments must be processed according to the following directions. 
The wrapped instruments must be autoclaved for 30 minutes at 121 degrees Celsius temperature and 15 PSI above the atmospheric pressure or for 15 minutes at 134 degrees Celsius temperature and 30 PSI above the atmospheric pressure. The unwrapped instruments must be autoclaved for 20 minutes at 121 degrees Celsius temperature and 15 PSI above the atmospheric pressure or for three to four minutes at 134 degrees Celsius temperature and 30 PSI above the atmospheric pressure. As the cycle ends and the pressure comes down to zero, the door of the autoclave must be opened up to a centimeter or two in order to let the steam escape. This must be followed by a drying cycle as per the instructions given by the autoclave manufacturers in order to dry the instruments. This process typically takes around 30 minutes. Also, you want to use sterile tongues to remove all the trays and instruments and cool them at room temperature before storing them. All unwrapped items are to be used immediately after autoclaving or must be kept in dry, sterile, and covered trays for a week. The wrapped packages must be stored in closed cabinets after ensuring that they are dry and warm enough to keep the instruments sterile. Let's now discuss dry heat sterilization. In this type of sterilization, aluminum foil is used to wrap all instruments. These wrapped instruments are arranged in sterilization trays and placed in the oven. The temperature duration, the temperature and duration, I should say, of dry heat sterilization must be set according to the following rules. 149 degrees Celsius for 2.5 hours, 180 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes, 160 degrees Celsius for two hours, 170 degrees Celsius for one hour, and 141 degrees Celsius for three hours. All instruments must be cooled down to room temperature before removing them from the oven and storing them. So let's discuss cold sterilization. This type of sterilization involves soaking the instruments in cold sterilant for approximately 10 hours. If only disinfection is the goal and not sterilization, the soaking time can be reduced to 10 to 90 minutes. The choice of the soaking solution must be according to the instruments. For example, solutions containing benzyl ammonium chloride must never be used while sterilizing tools with tungsten carbide inserts, such as forceps and scissors. So the question is, when do we need to sterilize? Well, in order to correctly determine whether an instrument needs sterilization, the Spalding classification must be utilized. This classification is a conventional approach to assess the level of sterilization or disinfection required for reusable instruments. The Spalding classification embarks on the extent of risk for infection transmission if an instrument is contaminated at the time of use. So according to this classification, all instruments fall into three categories. We have critical items, we also have semi-critical items, and we have non-critical items. And we will discuss what each of these items are, what the criteria is for each of these items. So let's look at critical items. These items need rigorous sterilization because they possess the highest risk for infecting a patient. They may include all tools that directly touch or enter 
of vascular tissues, body fluids, or sterile tissues such as catheters and implantable sensors. Let's look at semi-critical items. An object that comes in contact with a mucous membrane but does not enter the sterile tissues is categorized as semi-critical. Such items include endoscopes, temperature probes, and anesthesia equipment and require high level disinfection. Non-critical items. These items do not touch any mucous membrane but only come in contact with skin. Some common examples of non-critical items include surgical beds and blood pressure cuffs that must be properly cleaned using low-level disinfectant but do not require sterilization. We've reached the end of today's lecture and for assignment 4G, I'd like for you to name the basic instruments used by foot health practitioners, which podiatric instrument is excluded from foot health practice here in Bermuda, state which tools that should never be used in foot care maintenance, describe the donning and doffing process for PPE, describe the various types of methods used to clean, disinfect, sterilize podiatric equipment, and discuss why it is important for foot health practitioners to be vigilant about preventing cross-contamination and patient infection. This assignment is due this coming Sunday by 11.55 p.m. If you have any difficulty at all with this assignment, you may contact me by way of email or send me a text message. My office hours are always the same, Thursdays from 4 to 6 p.m. And with that, I look forward to receiving your assignments and I will see you in the next lecture.